Hello! In this particular video, we are going to cover a lot of territory. Um, we're going to start in chapter 14, and we're going to at least get two chapters. Um, if we look like we have a little more time, maybe we'll get more. But the goal of this video and the next video are going to be to do chapters 14 through 18. Now, that's a lot, but um, I think that it's doable, so we're going to try to do that. And we're going to start with one of the very, very difficult passages in terms of the emotional pull of Matthew, and that is the death of John the Baptist, because John the Baptist very much sets the tone and starts off Matthew. He's the one that introduces Jesus. He's the one that really, outside of New Testament, um, in terms of works that were written at that time, we actually know more about John the Baptist in terms of things written outside of the New Testament, um, almost than about Jesus. He is a figure that looms very large. And in this particular chapter, we see his death recorded. Um, I'm Because we have so much territory to cover, I'm not going to read everything. I encourage you to have read this whole section on your own. So I'm not going to read every single part. I'm just going to hit the highlights in this. Um, but you notice first thing is that he's going to be arrested by Herod the Tetrarch. Herod the Tetrarch is the um is the ruler of um is the ruler of both Galilee and Perea. So Galilee, where Jesus grew up, um, and where most of Jesus's ministry takes place is under Herod Antipas's rule and also Perea. So remember a lot of the work that you see being done uh, by John the Baptist takes place along the Jordan River. So we can actually see that here. I will share this with you, this map. Again, you can get this from Bible Odyssey. Dot org. A lot of great maps on here. It's from the Society of Biblical Literature. And you can see Perea and Galilee are both ruled by Herod Antipas or Herod the Tetrarch. And in this region, this seems to be where a lot of his ministry took place. It's kind of on the borderline. There's, there's the the Jordan River, and it's on the borderline between the Judean wilderness and the Perean wilderness. So he had this ministry that took place right here. And as part of this ministry, um, you see him making some pretty rough claims against Herod Antipas. Specifically, what he's going to say against Herod Antipas is he's going to condemn his marriage or relationship with, rather, um, Herodias. So we can go ahead and take a quick look at that here. Um, you can see, um, you can see, first of all, it kind of starts out by talking about how he's afraid of Jesus. He sees that Jesus is here and he, Herod is thinking, oh man, this is Jesus risen from, this is John the Baptist risen from the dead. He's worried because um, he's executed John the Baptist. And you see this picture of for when Herod had John arrested, he bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, the wife of his brother, Philip. So a very interesting story here. We actually can learn a lot about this from outside of the scriptures. And that is the fact that um, Herod is going to end up marrying. He's going to end up having a wife. Um, the, his wife will be the Nebatean king's uh, daughter. So he's married to the daughter of the Nebatean king. Nebatean kingdom is really, really close to Herod's own kingdom. And he's married to this king's what? This king's daughter, excuse me. And he ends up divorcing this king's daughter so he can have a relationship with his own brother's wife. Yes, that sounds very, very weird, and it is. Um, that's exactly what's going to happen. Herod, who is in a relationship, who is married to the Nabataean king's daughter, divorces his daughter so he can enter a relationship 
with his brother's wife, Herodias. Very, very twisted. Now, the interesting fact here is that that very act puts him in kind of an unusual situation because the fact that he did that means that he almost went to war with the Nabataean king. Um, the Nabataean king really declares war, and there were some events that took place that prevented that from getting fully blown. Um, that would have been very interesting. Rome would have gotten involved. Um, it's it's very, very interesting story that we can get from historical sources. But what's interesting here is Herod is very sensitive to this fact that he's married, he's got entered this relationship with his brother's wife and John the Baptist, who's one who's calling out, we've seen already, he has no problem calling people vipers and saying things about people. He calls out um, Herod Antipas and says, basically, look, you're not allowed to do this. It's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. That's not okay. So what's going to end up happening is he's going to arrest John the Baptist he doesn't want to kill him. He doesn't want to execute him because he's afraid of the crowd, because the crowds really are of the mind that, hey, we're going to intervene. Um, we're going to step in and uh, we're angry. We're And he's afraid of a riot. So what's going to end up happening here is that he doesn't want to, but he's going to be pushed. There's going to be this birthday party. He's going to promise. Um, he's going to promise the daughter of Herodias uh, that he'll give her anything, and she basically says, "Hey, kill John the Baptist." And because he doesn't want to be embarrassed or really dishonored in front of his fellow um, elites that he's there with, he goes ahead and he executes. He executes John the Baptist. So this is a very, very interesting story, and we have corroboration for it in Josephus that also talks. He doesn't talk about the, the particular birthday scene, um, but he does talk about John the Baptist being killed by Herod Antipas. So moving on, we see a really interesting part about Jesus um, is that uh, Jesus is going to hear about John. And here, we'll just read it. Verse 13. And when Jesus heard about John, he withdrew there, from there, in a boat to a secluded place by himself. And when the people heard about this, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when he had come ashore, they saw he saw the large crowd and he felt compassion for them and healed their sick. So it's a picture of Jesus is very much saddened by this. The loss of John is a huge hit. He's very sad about John dying, John being executed. Um, this is something that hits him particularly hard. So he retreats because um, his life is very active, right? He, people are constantly coming to him for healing. So he retreats from the public eye so that he can have some time alone. But of course, once he does this, crowds follow him and now in verse 15 it says now when it was evening the disciples came to him and said this place is secluded and the hour is already past to eat send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves and jesus said to them they do not need to go to you they do not need to go you give them food to eat. And they said to him, we do not, we have nothing here except five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. And ordering the crowds to sit down on the grass, he took the loaves and the two, the five loaves and the two fish. And he looked toward heaven and he blessed the food, breaking the loaves. He gave them to the disciples and his disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up all the leftovers and the broken pieces for 12 baskets full. 
And there were about, about 5,000 men who ate besides the women and children. So we have this picture of Jesus feeding um, what really could amount to probably 10,000 to 15,000 people because there's 5,000 men and we don't know how many women. Maybe there's an equal amount of women and children, or maybe there's an equal amount of women and an equal amount of children. We don't, we don't know. But we have this picture of 5,000 people being fed by Jesus from these loaves and fish. So you might ask yourself, okay, this is a weird story. What's the, what's the deal here? What's the purpose here? Well, actually, this goes all the way back, again, like so many things in Matthew, to miracles that we see done in the Old Testament. You see examples in the Old Testament of actual oil being multiplied. Um, you see a, um, a situation where there's a need for oil um, in order to pay certain debts. Um, and Elisha is able to help with that. He says, hey, you, you, you let this oil go and you move as many possible things as you move as many of these things as possible, filling up these jars and they're going to keep filling until you run out. And you have a multiplication of this oil. Um, there's another example of Elijah um, where there's a need for there's a need for them to eat, and you see them in that particular case, him multiplying the food so that her and Elijah and her son, the woman, the widow, Eli then Elijah, and then her son are able to eat for a long period of time. So we do see both Elijah and Elisha doing miracles that involve the um, the stretching or the um, the multiplication of food items. So the picture here is again this is another example of a miracle that could only happen through through God. So you have a clear picture that Jesus is not only um, doing things that the prophets did, but he's doing things that they couldn't possibly do, right? Because unlike those cases I just mentioned, he's not feeding one or two people or providing um, financial sustenance for um, just a, a one or two people. He's talking about thousands of people and he's multiplying this food for thousands of people. It's a nod back to that and saying not only is Jesus doing what the prophets did, Jesus is doing something that's even greater than what the prophets did. Um, the next thing we see kind of going up here in verse 22, it says, immediately afterward, he compelled his disciples to get into the boat and to go ahead of him to the other side. And while he sent the crowds away, after he had sent the crowds away, he went up onto the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him Walking on the sea, they were terrified and they said, it's a ghost. And then they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. So you have this picture of he sends the crowds away, fed, very well fed. He tells his, he tells his followers, go ahead and cross on your own. Go ahead and cross on your own. Um, with this, uh, with the boat, I'll figure it out. I'll catch up with you. And he goes up to have some quiet time to pray. Now, again, remember the whole time he came here. The whole reason he came here was so he can mourn the loss of John. Um, someone that we know from Luke is his cousin. And we know from here in Matthew and also in Mark is the one that really um, introduced him to the world. So you really see the humanness 
of Jesus. He came to mourn. He sees the people. He has compassion on them. He feeds them. He heals them. He 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 speaks with them. But then at the end of the day, he's like, I need time to go and pray, be along with the Lord, and then to mourn. And then to catch up, he walks on water. This is that famous scene that many people know about. Um, the, the sea is pretty bad. It's the waves are battering him. You have the wind and the waves. It's kind of stormy and choppy sea. And Jesus is walking across the water. And so if you're the disciples, here you are on the water and all of a sudden, um, you're rowing for your life, sailing for your life. And you just see a human being walking across the water. Well, the, the first thing that they think of is their superstitions, right? Is it's a ghost. Now, this is by no means a biblical affirmation that ghosts exist or whatever. That's a whole different discussion for a different day. Um, but just that this is a superstition that they had. This must be a ghost. And it's not. It's Jesus. So Jesus just says, don't fear. Don't be afraid. It's me. But I want you to get a picture of this. This is another picture of something that Jesus is doing that you don't that a human can't do. No prophet ever does this. Jesus is greater than the prophets. No prophet ever does this. And we see it goes even further. We see, then Peter responded and said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you. And he said, come. And, and then you have this whole this whole picture of he comes out, he he's doing it, but then he get Peter comes out of the boat, he's walking toward Jesus, he gets frightened, and then he starts to sink. And you have this picture here in verse 31. You of little faith, why did you doubt? It's the same kind of picture here of they just don't get it. Ooh, excuse me. They just don't get it. Um it, it, it's so easy for us as human beings, the disciples in particular, to doubt. And you see, and then those who were, who were in the boat worshiped him and said, you truly are God's son. You truly are the son of God. Again, this is a picture. No one could do this but the son of God. No one could do this but God himself. That's how big of a deal this is. And when they had crossed, they came to the land of Gennesaret and when the men of that place recognized him, they sent word to all the surrounding region and they brought to him those who were sick and they pleaded with him that he might just touch the border of their cloak and he touched it and all who touched it were cured. So you see this picture of everywhere he goes, people are coming to him, touch me, heal me, do something. Tell me about this. So you really see a picture of Jesus just being the most famous person you could imagine in this region around Galilee, which is where most of his ministry is centered um, around the Sea of Galilee, give or take, whether it be Galilee itself or to the over in the other areas north and uh, east of that. So let's look at 15. It says some of the Pharisees and the scribes. So notice here, scribes, again, you can have scribes that are both, you can have scribes that are Pharisees and you can have scribes that are Sadducees. The indication most likely here is that these are these are scribes, people who are experts in the law, who are allied to the Pharisees. So some of the scribes and Pharisees came, or Pharisees and scribes, came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, now I want you to notice something. Where is most of Jesus' ministry taking place? In Galilee. Okay? So just to kind of get a clear picture here, show you a map, most of Jesus' ministry is taking place here. In Galilee, over a little bit in the Decapolis, and then over here in Gal Galinitis. Okay? So it's all taking place in these in this area that's where most of it's taking place but a lot in galilee even some up here in tear um which we'll see we'll talk about eventually but word his ministry has become so effective 
so impactful. That word has gotten to people in Jerusalem and they've sent representatives. They've sent representatives over to Galilee to check him out. Um, so that just kind of lets you know the reach that Jesus's ministry is having at this point. Um, so these Pharisees and scribes, they came to him from Jerusalem and they say this, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. So Mark actually, in Mark chapter seven, he gives you a whole lot more information here. Um, what's important for you to know here is there's no, first of all, this is not the idea of washing your hands with soap and water. Um, this is not about cleanliness. This is about, again, ritual purity. Mark makes it very clear that that's what this is about. When he describes this same incident, he talks about ritual purity. And basically the Pharisees were so concerned about if a person is ritually pure, which again, if you look at the Old Testament, what matters is if you're ritually pure when you go into the temple um, to make sacrifices. But the Pharisees have expanded it to every aspect of life. We all need to be ritually pure as much as possible. So what they do is there's these traditions of the elders. So this is not scripture, but this is what teachers from the past have taught. Um, rabbis and other teachers have taught, and these are the traditions of the elders. So what they've done is they've built these traditions around the law, these, these basic interpretations of uh, the law and the prophets, or the Torah and then the other works of the Old Testament. So they've taken those old, what we consider the Old Testament, and They've said, okay, well, you have all of these ideas in the Old Testament, and we need to interpret them. So they've taken the traditions of the elders, which are not scripture. They're not on the same par as the word of God as scripture. And they've they've built all these up, and they've risen them up to where they're almost kind of like scripture. And so that's what's at stake here is they're saying, look, your disciples are not washing their hands before they eat. Again, this is just water pouring over their hands. This is a ritual cleansing. This is not um, for sanitary, sanitary reasons. So why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? They do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And then he answered and said to them, why do you yourselves also break the commandment of God for your tradition?" So Jesus's point is not even to really deal so much with that particular their particular issue. And he says, you want to get on to my people for breaking the traditions made by man, but your traditions put you in a situation where you break God's law, right? So Jesus is one-upping them. He's saying, you're mad about breaking men's traditions? Well, these men's traditions that you have, the traditions of the elders, they're leading you to break God's law. And God's law is way more important. And so where is he going with this? And he answered and said to them, why do you yourselves also break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? And now he gives an example. For God said, honor your father and mother. And one who speaks evil of his father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God, or is Corbin, is an, uh, the word that gets used here. He is not to honor his father and mother. And by this, you have invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah say about you by saying, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. And in vain, they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So let's break this down. Let's see what's happening here. So first of all, he says, you guys, 
what is the way that your tradition is giving you permission to violate God's law? And he gives one of these really, really important commands. Um, and that is the, of the Ten Commandments. Uh, for God said, honor your father and mother. And then another command that's not part of the Ten Commandments, but it's a flushing out of that. Um, one who speaks evil of his father and mother shall be put to death, right? That's a pretty powerful one. Um, so what, is, what do these say? What's the point here that Jesus is making? Well, one thing that's really clear here is that Jesus is saying the command to honor your father and mother goes beyond childhood. It's not just to the child. The command to honor your father and mother extends to adulthood. That's the picture here. And the way that we honor our father and mother in adulthood is if they are financially destitute or if they're too old to take care of themselves, we as the children take on the responsibility of honoring our elders by taking care of that honored person, that parent of ours. So it says, for God said, honor your father and mother. Now, and one who speaks evil of their father and mother will be put to death. Now look at what he says here. But you say, the tradition of the elders say, what you're teaching people is this. Whoever says to his father and mother, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God. He does not have to honor his father and mother. Now, he's not talking about children here because everything as a child, Everything you have, your parents are giving you everything you have. You don't own anything. You're a kid. You don't own anything, um, especially in this culture. So the point is he's talking about adult children. So what's happening here is the, the, um, the tradition of the elders has said, yes, scripture says that if you have an elderly father and mother that can't take care of themselves, you have to pay to take care of them. But there's a loophole. If you have said, oh, my money is for God, and you've dedicated your money to God, then that money's not technically yours, so you don't have to use it to support your parents. That's the picture here. It's been given to God. It's been declared Corbin is what you'll see this translated as sometimes. So what's probably happening here is there's some kind of thing where they're saying they're going to the temple or they're doing something like that and they're getting their money declared as if it's God's money. They're not getting rid of their money. They still have it. They're not giving it all away, um, but they're declaring my this money is blessed for God. And now as a result, when their father and mother come to them and says, look, I'm destitute. Like I need your help. Um, I need, I'm old. I'm in my old age. I spent my youth taking care of you. And now I'm an old age. Um, then they're saying, Hey, you know, my, I don't have, sorry, I can't help you. All my money is dedicated to the Lord. So I can't help you. And then really Jesus is getting very angry about this. He's very frustrated. And he's saying, by this, you have invalidated the word of God for your tradition. He says, your tradition, you've created a loophole. God said, honor your parents. And one way, well, the key way that you honor them is when they're older, you take care of them financially. And your tradition has made a loophole to keep that has allowed people to get around doing this. And Jesus is fuming. He's really angry about this. And he says, by this, you have invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. And he says, this people honors me with their lips. They say, look how holy I am. I know God so well. I love the Lord. I'm, I'm dedicating my money to him. He says, but their heart is far away from him. And I hope you can see that theme throughout Matthew is that you have people who are claiming to be of God. Their, their good works, so to speak, their tradition, all of these things that they do is aimed at making it look like 
They're following God, making it look like they're true children of Abraham. But the reality is, is if they don't have faith in God, they, they don't actually have genuine faith. Their heart is not really for the Lord. Their outward activity makes it look like everything they do is gazed at trying to make people think that they're really following the Lord. They have all of these so-called works, but their heart is far from the Lord. And they worship him in vain because they're teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Basically, they're taking tradition and they're putting it on the same level as God's word. Um, so after Jesus called the crowd to him, he said to them, hear and understand, it is not what enters the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. The point that he's making here is, y'all talk about ritual purity. Now he's addressing their issue. Y'all talking about ritual purity, thinking that if I touch something that's impure and then eat my food, ritually impure, not we're not talking about germs here. That's not the point that they're making. He's saying, that's not what defiles a person. It's what comes out. It's the hateful, evil things. It's the lies. It's the duplicity. Um, it's the harsh words. The things that come out of a person are the things that defile them, not the things that go in. That's the point that he's making spiritually. And when the disciples came to him and said, do you know what the fair um, know that the Pharisees are were offended when they heard the statement? And he answered, "Every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant will be uprooted. Leave them alone. They are blind guides of blind people, or the blind leading the blind, um, as some translations will say. And if a person who is blind." guides another who is blind, they will both fall into a pit. I want to zero in on the statement of what we're seeing here. Um, every plant which my heavenly father did not plant will be uprooted. The point he's making is these people claim to be close to him. They claim to be his people. Again, we go all the way back to John the Baptist. He was saying something similar, right? Um, these people make a big claim that they're following the Lord, but they're not. And he's saying, look, God's going to uproot them. And what John the Baptist said the same thing. God's got his axe ready and he's about to cut your tree down. Um, so it, it's that similar thing. Um, they're pretending they're playing the game, but they're not really of the Lord. Um, so next we go down further and we see um, Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. And Jesus said, are you still lacking in understanding? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that come out of the mouth from the heart, those things defile the person. For out of the heart comes every all the evil thoughts, murder, acts of adultery, immoral acts, thefts, um, false testimony, slanderous statements. These are the things that defile the person. But to eat un with unwashed hands does not defile a person. Again, the idea here is, the, the tradition of the elders, the Pharisees, their idea here is it the outward body is so important um, because um, there's all these ritually impure things that if I come in contact with them, whether they be bodily fluid or... Um, any anything that might defile me. Um, if just an unclean, a ritually unclean person touched a pot that you bought, then now you're ritually unclean if you don't wash it. Again, not germs, ritual purity. And what Jesus is saying is they make such a big deal about what's on the outside coming in. But what they don't pay attention is the fact that inside their heart, they have evil thoughts. They have murder. They have acts of adultery. They have immoral acts. They have thefts. They're so, so focused on maintaining their outward appearance that inside of their heart is totally decayed. And see, that's the point here is what we, what we need to see is that 
Um, we need to put our faith, the call of Jesus is that we need to put our faith in him, put our faith in God, and that when we put our faith in God, um, we turn towards him in true faith, that he changes the heart, that he works in the heart. They're doing a, let's change my outside, and I don't care about the heart. He's saying, no, no, you need to turn and put true faith in God. And God purifies the heart. So next we see the Canaanite woman. And um, sometimes you hear it called the Syrophoenician woman. So Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Um, and a Canaanite woman from the region came out and began crying out saying have mercy on me lord son of david so again this is a recognition that he's the messiah son of david my daughter is severely demon possessed but he did not answer her with even a word and his disciples came to him and urged him saying send her away because she keeps shouting at us but he answered and said I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. Yet he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, but please help, for even the dogs feed on the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus said to her, O oh, woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you desire. And your and her daughter was healed at once. So I want you to grasp here what we're seeing. And that is a Gentile woman. Now, hopefully up to this point of me teaching through this, you've picked up on the fact that it's been a little subtle. He hasn't just come out and said it. But Jesus has given little hints here and there um, that he's come to the people of Israel, but that ultimately um, all peoples, um, he's willing to work among all peoples. So, up to, so by the time we get here, we've already had him do ministry in the Decapolis and do ministry um, to where he he's even taking this centurion he's even said hey this centurion i haven't seen faith in all of israel equal to this guy um so you've already seen jesus give these subtle hints that yes he's come to the israelites but that there's room for the gentiles and he even makes that statement he says i surely i tell you that there are many from the east and the west that are going to come and sit at the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. But there are sons of the kingdom that will be cast out into the outer darkness. You know, so he's made it very clear up to this point that um, you're going to have um, people who are accepted who are Gentiles. And now this woman comes and he uses this as an opportunity to make a point. I think that's clearly what's going on here. He's trying to make a point um, to the people, to her and to the people that are present. And you have this very interesting thing where he says he's not calling her a dog. OK, but some people will say this is influence, um, you know, say this and make a big deal about it. He called this woman a dog. He's using an illustration. He's saying look, you know, he's saying, look, I've come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So I've come to the people like the sinners and the tax collectors and the others who have are basically lost. Um, I'm coming to them. And, and he's saying, you know, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. He's, he's giving an illustration. He's not calling her a dog. Um, I could see that it feels that way, but he's giving an illustration. It's like, Look, the children of Israel, they're my they're the people I've come to. You don't take the food that you've gotten from them and throw it uh, to those who are not um of the family or not of the kingdom, not you know, and and the point here 
I think is really clear. He's trying to get this interaction. I think he knows what he's doing here. I don't think he's being unnecessarily provocative. I think he knows what she's going to say. He knows what he's doing here. And he's trying to elicit this response. And you see her response saying, look, you know, even the dogs get the crumbs. Like, help us out. And, and you see, he's like, woman, your faith is great. He's pointing, just like the centurion. He's pointing to her faith and he's saying, guys, look at this. This is someone who is persistent and they know that God can do something. And they're they're willing to come and ask. Um, so it's just a great picture. And and what he the point he's making is that she really gets the heart of God. She really gets God's heart. So now um departing from there, Jesus went along the Sea of Galilee, and after going up onto the mountain and sitting there, large crowds came to him, uh, bringing to them those who were limp. Uh, with impaired limbs who were blind and able, able to speak, and many others laid down at his feet, and he healed them. And so the crowd was astonished as they saw who were able, um, that those who were able to speak, unable to speak, talking, and those with impaired limbs restored and um, limping, walking around, and those who were blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. So he he has this um, he has this other group come up to him, and he starts healing this crowd. And what we're going to see here is the same feeding of the five thousand story is going to play out all over again. Only this time it's a feeding of four thousand men, not counting women and children. Um, so we see that the same kind of thing plays out. The difference is we have seven fish. I mean, we have uh, seven loaves and only a few small fish. So there's a different um, a different number of people. Um, and there's a different amount of food. Um, yet he's going to do this miracle again. Now, the question that a lot of people have here is why does he do the same miracle twice? And why is it necessary to record it? And the most common answer here is that this is to a group of Gentiles. Is that in one case, he is, in, in one of the cases of the feeding of the large crowd, it's to Jews. In the other case, it's to Gentiles. So this is a picture, again, reinforced by the Syrophoenician woman and by the centurion on all of these things. Um, it's a picture that, Jesus, yes, he came to the Israelites, but he always had an eye on the Gentiles. Um, that whole Syrophoenician woman point, it's all part of that. Yeah, but the people of Israel are going to reject him to some degree, and he's got his eyes on the Gentiles. And that's why you have this repeated story here um, over again. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and stop here and we'll pick back up in chapter 16, verse 1, and um, we will move from there.